Greetings. Uh, this is video number 16 of the poem Savagery by Sri Aurobindo. And this is Canto 3 of Book 5, Satyavan and Savitri. Out of the voiceless mystery of the past, in a present ignorant of forgotten bonds, these spirits met upon the roads of time. Yet in the heart their secret conscious selves, at once aware grew of each other, warned by the first call of a delightful voice, and a first vision of the destined face, as when being cries to being from its depths, behind the screen of the external sense, and strives to find the heart disclosing word, the passionate speech revealing the soul's need, but the mind's ignorance veils the inner sight. Only a little breaks through our earth-made bounds. So now they met in that momentous hour. So utter the recognition in the deeps, the remembrance lost, the oneness felt and missed. Thus Satyavan spoke first to Savitri. O thou who comest to me out of time silences, Yet thy voice has wakened my heart to an unknown bliss, immortal or mortal, only in thy frame. Far more than earth speaks to me from thy soul, and more than earth surrounds me in thy gaze. How art thou named among the sons of men? Whence hast thou dawned, filling my spirit's days, brighter than summer, brighter than my flowers, into the lonely borders of my life, O oh, sunlight molded like a golden maid, I know that mighty gods are friends of earth. Amid the pageantries of day and dusk, long have I traveled with my pilgrim soul, moved by the marvel of familiar things. Earth could not hide from me the powers she veils, even though moving mid an earthly scene, and the common surfaces of terrestrial things, my vision saw unblinded by her forms. The Godhead looked at me from familiar scenes. I witnessed the virgin bridles of the dawn behind the glowing curtains of the sky, or vying in joy with the bright morning steps. I paced along the slumberous coast of noon, or the gold desert of the sunlight crossed, traversing great wastes of splendor and of fire, or met the moon gliding amazed through heaven in the uncertain wideness of the night, or the stars marched on their long sentinel routes, pointing their spears through the infinitudes. The day and dusk revealed to me hidden shapes. Figures have come to me from secret shores, and happy faces looked from ray and flame. I have heard strange voices cross the ether's waves. The centaur's wizard song has thrilled my ear. I have glimpsed the apsaras bathing in the pools. I have seen the wood nymphs peering through the leaves. The winds have shown to me their trampling lords. I have beheld the princes of the sun burning in thousand pillared homes of light. So now my mind could dream and my heart fear that from some wonder couch behind, beyond our air, risen in a wide morning of the gods, thou drovest thy horses from the thunderer's worlds. Although to heaven thy beauty seems allied, much rather would my thoughts rejoice to know that mortal sweetness smiles between thy lids and thy heart can beat beneath a human gaze and thy aureate, aureate bosom quiver with a look, and its tumult answer to an earth-born voice. If our time-vexed affections thou canst feel, earth's ease of simple things can satisfy, if thy glance can dwell content on earthly soil, and this celestial summary of delight, thy golden body dally with fatigue, Oppressing with its grace our terrain, 
while the frail, sweet passing taste of earthly food delays thee in the torrent's leaping wine, descend, let thy journey cease, come down to us. Close as my father's creepered hermitage, screened by the tall ranks of these silent kings, sung to by voices of the hero choirs, whose chants repeat transcribed in music's notes the passionate colored lettering of the bows, and fill the hours with their melodious cry. Amid the welcome hum of many bees, invade our honeyed kingdom of the woods. There let me lead thee into an opulent life. Bare, simple is the sylvan hermit life, yet is it clad with the jewelry of earth. Wild winds run, visitors midst the swaying tops. Through the calm days, heaven's sentinels of peace, couched on a purple robe of sky above, look down on a rich secrecy and hush, and the chambered nuptial waters chant within. Enormous, whispering, many formed around, high forest gods have taken in their arms the human hour, a guest of their centuried pomps. Apparelled are the morns in gold and green, sunlight and shadow tapestry the walls to make a resting chamber fit for thee. A while she paused as if hearing still his voice, unwilling to break the charm, then slowly spoke. Musing, she answered, I am Savitri, Princess of Madra. Who art thou? What name musical on earth expresses thee to men? What trunk of kings watered by fortunate streams has flowered at last upon one happy branch? Why is thy, pelling in, why is thy dwelling in the pathless wood far from the deeds thy glorious youth demands, haunt of the anchorites and earth's wilder broods, where only with thy witness self thou roamest in nature's green unhuman loneliness, surrounded by enormous silences, and the blind murmur of primeval calms? And Satyavan replied to Savitri, In days when yet his sight looked clear on life, King Dayumatsina once, the Shalwa, reigned through all the tract which from behind these tops, passing its days of emerald delight, and trusting converse with the traveler winds turns, looking back towards the southern heavens, and leans its flank upon the musing hills. But equal fate removed her covering hand, a living light enclosed the strong man's path, paths. Heaven's brilliant gods recalled their careless gifts, took from blank eyes their glad and helping ray, and led the uncertain goddess from his side. Outcast from the empire of the outer light, lost to the comradeship of seeing men, he sojourns in two solitudes, within, and in the solemn rustle of the woods. Son of that king, I, Satyavan, have lived contented, for not yet of thee aware, in my high people loneliness of spirit, and this huge vital murmur kin to me, nursed by the vastness, pupil of solitude. Great nature came to her recovered child. I reigned in a kingdom of a nobler kind than men can build upon dull matter soil. I met the frankness of the primal earth. I enjoyed the intimacy of infant God. In the great tapestried chambers of her state, free in her boundless palace I have dwelt, indulged by the warm mother of us all, reared with my natural brothers in her house. I lay in the wide bare embrace of heaven. The sunlight's radiant blessing clasped my brow. The moonbeam silver ecstasy at night kissed my dim lids to sleep. Earth's morns were mine. Lured by faint murmurings with the green-robed hours, I wandered lost in woods, prone to the voice of winds and waters, partner of sun's joy. 
a listener to the universal speech. My spirit satisfied within me knew God like our birthright, luxuried our life, whose close belongings are the earth and skies. Before fate led me into this emerald world, aroused by some foreshadowing touch within, an early prescience in my mind approached the great dumb animal consciousness of earth, now grown so close to me who have left old pomps to live in this grandiose murmur, dim and vast. Already I met her in my spirit's dream, as if to a deeper country of the soul, transposing the vivid imagery of earth, through an inner seeing and sense awakening came. A vision spell perused my boyhood's hours. All things the eye had caught in colored lines were seen anew through the interpreting mind and in the shape it sought to seize the soul. An early child God took my hand that held, moved, guided by the seeking of his touch, bright forms and hues which fled across his sight. Limbed upon page and stone they spoke to men. High beauty's visitants my in intimates were. The neighing pride of rapid life that roams wild mane through our pastures on my seeing mood cast shapes of swiftness, trooping spotted deer against the vesper sky became a song of evening to the silence of my soul. I caught for some eternal eye the sudden kingfisher flashing to a darkling pool, a slow swan silvering the azure lake, a shape of magic whiteness sailed through dream, leaves trembling with the passion of the wind, pranked butterflies, the conscious flowers of air, and wandering wings in blue infinity, lived on the tablets of my inner sight. Mountains and trees stood there like thoughts from God. The brilliant longbills in their vivid dress, the peacock scattering on the breeze his moons, painted my memory like a frescoed wall. I carved my vision out of wood and stone. I caught the echoes of a word supreme and metered the rhythm beats of infinity and listened through music for the eternal voice. I felt a covert touch. I heard a call, but could not clasp the body of my God or hold between my hands the world mother's feet. In men I met strange portions of a self that sought for fragments and in fragments lived. Each lived in himself and for himself alone, and with the rest joined only fleeting ties. Each passioned over his surface joy and grief, nor saw the eternal in his secret house. I conversed with nature, mused with the changeless stars, God's watchfires burning in the ignorant night, and saw upon her mighty visage fall a ray prophetic of the eternal sun. I sat with the four sages in their trance. There poured awakening streams of diamond light. I glimpsed the presence of the one in all. But still there lacked the last transcendent power, and matter still slept empty of its Lord. The spirit was saved, the body lost and mute, lived still with death and ancient ignorance. The unconscient was its base, the void its fate. But thou hast come, and all will surely change. I shall feel the world mother in thy golden limbs, and hear her wisdom in thy sacred voice. The child of the void shall be reborn in God. My matter shall evade the unconscious trance. My body, like my spirit, shall be free. It shall escape from death and ignorance and savagery, musing still, replied to him, Speak more to me, speak more, O Satyavan, speak of thyself and all thou art within. I would know thee as if we had ever lived together in the chamber of our souls. Speak till a light shall come into my heart, 
and my moved mortal mind shall understand what the, all the deathless being in me feels. It knows that thou art he my spirit has sought amidst earth's thronging visages and forms across the golden spaces of my life. And Satyavan, like a replying harp to the insistent calling of a flute, answered her questioning and let stream to her his heart in many colored waves of speech. O oh, golden princess, perfect Savitri, more I would tell than failing words can speak of all that thou hast meant to me unknown, all that the lightning flash of love reveals in one great hour of the unveiling gods. Even a brief nearness has reshaped my life. For now I know that all I lived and was moved towards this moment of my heart's rebirth. I look back on the meaning of myself, a soul made ready on earth's soil for thee. Once were my days like days of other men. To think and act was all, to enjoy and breathe. This was the width and height of mortal hope. Yet there came glimpses of a deeper self that lives behind life and makes her act its scene. A truth was felt that screened its shape from mind, a greatness working towards a hidden end, and vaguely through the forms of earth there looks something that life is not and yet must be. I groped for the mystery with the lantern thought, its glimmerings lighted with the abstract word, a half-visible ground, and traveling yard by yard, it mapped a system of the self and God. I could not live the truth it spoke and thought. I turned to seize its form in visible things, hoping to fix its rule by mortal mind, imposed a narrow structure of world law upon the freedom of the infinite, a hard firm skeleton of outward truth, a mental scheme of a mechanic power. This light showed more of the darknesses unsearched, it made the original secrecy more occult. It could not analyze its cosmic veil or glimpse the wonder worker's hidden hand and trace the pattern of his magic plans. I plunged into an inner seeing mind and knew the secret laws and sorceries that make of matter mind's bewildered slave. The mystery was not solved but deepened more. I strove to find its hints through beauty and art, but form cannot unveil the indwelling power, only it throws its symbols at our hearts. It evoked a mood of self, it invoked a sign of all the brooding glory hidden in sense. I lived in the ray but faced not the sun. I looked upon the world and missed the self, and when I found the self, I lost the world. My other selves I lost and the body of God, the link of the finite with the infinite, the bridge between the appearance and the truth, the mystic aim for which the world was made, the human sense of immortality. But now the gold link comes to me with thy feet and his gold sun has shone on me from thy face. For now another realm draws near with thee, and now diviner voices fill my ear. A strange new world swims to me in thy gaze, approaching like a star from unknown heavens. A cry of spheres comes with thee, and a song of flaming gods. I draw a wealthier breath, and in a fierier march of moments move. My mind transfigures to a rapturous Seer, a foam leap traveling from the waves of bliss, has changed my heart and changed the earth around. All with thy coming fills, air, soil, and stream, where bridal raiment to be fit for thee. And sunlight grows a shadow of thy hue, because of change within me by thy look. Come nearer to me from thy car of light on this green sward disdaining not our soil.
For here are secret spaces made for thee, whose caves of emerald long to screen thy form. Wilt thou not make this mortal bliss thy sphere? Descend, O happiness, with thy moon-gold feet, and rich earth's floors upon whose sleep we lie. O my bright beauty's princess, savagery, by my delight and thy own joy compelled, enter my life, thy chamber, and thy shrine. In the great quietness where spirits meet, led by my hushed desire into my woods, let the dim rustling arches over thee lean, one with the breath of things eternal live, thy heart beats near to mine, till there shall leap, enchanted from the fragrance of the flowers, a moment which all murmurs shall recall, and every bird remember in its cry. Allured to her lashes by his passionate words, her fathomless soul looked out at him from her eyes, passing her lips in liquid sounds that spoke. This word alone she uttered and said all. O Satyavan, I have heard thee and I know. I know that thou and only thou art he. Then down she came from her high cavern car, descending with a soft and faltering haste, her many-hued raiment glistening in the light, hovered a moment over the wind-stirred grass, mixed with a glimmer of her body's ray, like lovely plumage of a settling bird. Her gleaming feet upon the green-gold sward scattered a memory of wandering beams, and lightly pressed the unspoken desire of earth, cherished in her too brief passing by the soil. Then, flitting like a pale brilliant moth, her hands took from the sylvan verge's sunlit arms a load of their jewel faces clustering swarms, companions of the springtime and the breeze. A candid garland set with simple forms, her rapid fingers taught a flower song, the stanzed movement of a marriage hymn. Profound in perfume and immersed in hue, they mixed their yearnings colored signs and made the bloom of their purity and passion one. A sacrament of joy and treasuring palm she brought, flower symbol of her offered life, then with raised hands that trembled a little now at the very closeness that her soul desired, this bond of sweetness, this bright union sign, she laid on the bosom coveted, coveted by her love. As if inclined before some gracious God, who has out of his mist of greatness shown to fill with beauty his adorer's hours, she bowed and touched his feet with worshiping hands. She made her life his world for him to tread and made her body the room of his delight, her beating heart a remembrancer of bliss. He bent to her and took into his own their married yearning, joined like folded hopes as if a whole rich world suddenly possessed, wedded to all he had been, became himself, an inexhaustible joy made his alone. He gathered all Savitri into his clasp. Around her, his embrace became the sign of a locked closeness through slow, intimate years, a first sweet summary of delight to come, one brevity intense of all long life. In a wide moment of two souls that meet, she felt her being flow into him as in waves a river pours into a mighty sea. As when a soul is merging into God to live in him forever and know his joy, her consciousness grew aware of him alone and all her separate self was lost in his. As a starry heaven encircles happy earth, he shut her into himself in a circle of bliss and shut the world into himself and her. A boundless isolation made them one. He was aware of her enveloping him and let her penetrate his very soul 
as is a world by the world spirit filled, as the mortal wakes into eternity, as the finite opens to the infinite. Thus they were in each other lost a while, then drawing back from their long ecstasy's trance, came into a new self and a new world. Each now was a part of the other's unity. The world was but their twin self-finding scene, or their own wedded being's vaster frame. On the high glowing cupola of the day, fate tied a knot with morning's halo threads. While by the ministry of an auspice hour, heart bound before the sun, their marriage fire, the wedding of the eternal Lord, Lord and spouse, took place again on earth in human forms. In a new act of the drama of the world, the united two began a greater age. In the silence and murmur of that emerald world, and the mutter of the priest wind's sacred verse, amid the choral whispering of the leaves, love's twain had joined together and grew one. The natural miracle was wrought once more, in the immutable ideal world, one human moment was eternal made. Then, down the narrow path where their lives had met, he led and showed to her her future world, love's refuge and corner of happy solitude. At the pass end, through a green cleft in the trees, she saw a clustering line of hermit roofs, and looked now first on her heart's future home, the thatch that covered the life of Satyavan. Adorned with creepers and red climbing flowers, it seemed a sylvan beauty in her dreams, slumbering with brown body and tumbled hair in her chamber in violet of emerald peace. Around it stretched the forest's anchorite mood, lost in the depths of its own solitude. Then moved by the deep joy she could not speak, a little depth of it quivering in her hands, a little depth of it quivering in her words, her happy voice cried out to Satyavan, My heart will stay here on this forest verge, and close to this thatched roof while I am far. Now of more wandering it has no need, but I must haste back to my father's house, which soon will lose one loved accustomed tread, and listen in vain for a once cherished voice. For soon I shall return, nor ever again oneness must sever its recovered bliss, or fate sunder our lives while life is ours. Once more she mounted on the cavern car, and under the ardor of a fiery noon, less bright than the splendor of her thoughts and dreams, she sped swift-reined, swift-hearted, but still saw in still the lucid lucidities of sight's inner world, in still lucidities of sight's inner world, through the cool scented woods' luxurious gloom, on shadowy paths between great rugged trunks, paced towards a tranquil clearing, Satyaban. A nave of trees enshrined the hermit thatch, the new deep covert of her felicity. Preferred to heaven her soul's temple and home. This now remained with her, her heart's constant scene. That is the end of Canto 3, the end of Book 5, the end of video number 16 of the poem Savitry by Sri Aurobindo.